Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Unbelievers. I'm Cam's The Unbeliever, joined as always by... Barge The Unbeliever. Excellent. How are you today, Barge? Uh, Alright, I mean, body's a bit kind of worn down with things, but then, you know... Maybe that's in sympathy with old TC. Huh. Although he's on the mend, you know, in a way. Kinda. Mm hmm. <laughs> but yeah. No, all right, all right. Just um, body's tired, but mind's here. I'm Excellent. present. That's all we need. So today we're looking at chapter 15 The Great Challenge. So we're still in Revelstone. And we've just had the big meeting, the Council of Lords. Um, and he's become an Earl Lord on the spot, promoted. On the spot, yeah. And that comes up again later in today's chapter, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he had the option of a double promotion, yeah, that's for sure. Aye. <laughs> so, he's with Banner. Banner's not his best pal. Yeah, I mean, he kind of uh, says, you still don't trust me. Yeah, there's a lack of trust, I think, on both sides. Mm. And Banner's got his own thing going on. You know, he's got his vow. And I guess he sees Covenant as a threat. And he says, the blood guards, we don't have use for white gold. So he's not impressed by the white gold thing, mm. so yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, and all the lords are like bowing down, you know, our Lord Covenant, you've got the white gold, and Banner's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Foam Follow, on the other hand, seems to be quite happy, in a way. Foam Follower's always happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about him. Yeah, he he tells Covenant that he has lightened his fear for the land. Wow! All right, so so something in a Covenant must have given him confidence or something. So it's kind of the diametric opposite of the Blood Guard, isn't it? Oh uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And aren't those your favourite races, the Blood Guards and the Giants? No, just the giants. Oh, just the giants. It wasn't the blood gods. Right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, so they go off to uh, the meeting to the Council of Lords, the same uh, the same place, huh? Yeah, yeah it's like a follow-up in it after the big yeah. meeting went down. Except this time, uh, there are quite a few people. Yeah. Spectators. Yeah, that was interesting. You know, there's another bit later on where we get told about the people of the city of Revelstone. So there's there's a lot of punters about that just live there, I suppose. Yeah, later on we do find out at uh, towards the end of the chapter that that there must be loads because I mean, crowds are described. Yeah, yeah. Well, there must be a lot of people that are. Actually, I don't know. There are not a lot of people required because there aren't that many lords to be looked after. But I suppose in a place of safety like that, that's really big, it makes sense for it to be a a city of sorts. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the population has had a few centuries in which to kind of um, expand. <laughs> I mean, and, and if you have... If you have a settled, peaceful kind of like that's conducive to family and child re- rearing and stuff like that. So yeah, presumably, um, right. So so there's a little bit of action then with Prothol coming in and starting the meeting, huh? Yeah, he starts out by mentioning a custom among the new lords. So these are the new lords who've come after the desecration, and he mentions High Lord. Valent, which I'd forgotten all about, who was High Lord a hundred years ago. So that gives us an an insight into how different the timeline is for old versus new. Because remember, Kevin was High Lord for a thousand years. This guy here, High Lord Valent, a hundred years. So I guess it's to do with the, the loss of the lore, that people don't 
live as long now because they don't have all the lore that the old lords had. That's just what I'm guessing from that. Right. Makes sense, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, basically, he he talks about uh, this custom where any lord may come to the council and surrender his high lordship. Yeah. Or when a high lord doubts his ability to meet the needs of the land, he may come to the council and surrender his high lordship. Uh, and then any lord who so chooses may claim the place for himself. Right? So, uh, at first I was wondering, like, is he offering TC a chance to kind of, like, back out? But but no, then he comes out with it and he says, I'm surrendering my high lordship. Uh-huh. And Thomas Covenant, would you fancy the job? <laughs> yeah, I mean, from where he's just come to being mistrusted by everyone on every level. As soon as he brought the white gold out, it was like, okay, do you want the top job? Do you want the top job? Yeah, it doesn't matter what you've done, uh, how much we kind of suspected that you may or may not be a trap sent by Lord Fowl, whatever. Yeah. Nonetheless, white gold, and here you go. I mean, it's like, I don't know, anyway. Uh, Thomas Governor just says, forget it. Yeah. I ain't interested, man. Well, it's like, remember last week when we discussed that, that paradox of of how Covenant just can't get them to see that he's not the guy they're looking for. He's got no power, he's impotent. He just can't get that across. And, and all of a sudden they're like, okay, do you want to be High Lord? It's like, what? <laughs> Are you not hearing me? Yeah, right. Okay, now that's that's well well put, very well put. So um, yeah. So then uh, Prothol says, "All right, then. Um, no one else wants the job. Fine. I'll 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 stay heat punter." Well, he had no choice, did he? He couldn't just step down and leave it vacant. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, and. <sighs> I mean, it seems a bit nuts, actually, you know? Like, what does Thomas Coven know? And, like, exactly. you know, this is, this is like a real time of crisis, and you're getting this guy who, who might be the savior or the guy who dams the land to be the heat punter. Yeah. I mean. And he, he's only been in the land for, what, a few months at the most? And he thinks it's a dream and not real. Yeah. And he doesn't know any of the land. I mean, later on he asks about the Ranahan, doesn't he? When they call the horses. We'll get to that later. But Yeah, and he doesn't know the lore. No. I mean, surely a, a high high lord must be aware of some of that. But he he is aware of the foul and drool situation. He seems to be quite clued up with that. That comes up later on when they're having the discussion. Yeah. When the, the lords are all going back and forth about has Drool got the ill earth stone or has he not? Has Lord Fowl got the staff or has he given orders to Rockworm? So they're all like, we don't know, we don't know. And, and then Covenant says, listen to me. And then he he puts them in the picture. So he's he's aware of what's going on, I think more so than I would expect, given his newness to the land, etc., Hmm, right. The lords are just going back and forth with we don't know what to do kind of thing, but High Lord Prothol does actually seem quite decisive at one point later on. Um, Othondria is the one who does have a theory, though. She seems to uh, uh, talk about a drool rockworm she now she nodded her head as if uh, to clear it of other considerations. I've given my time to study of uh, Covenant's tale of his journey. White gold explains much, but still many things require thought. South running storms, a three winged bird, uh, the attack on the wraiths, the mm. blooding of, of the moon. And then she links all of these to. Uh, Drool, because she says the staff is not a neutral tool. And we know that Drool has it. And 
At his peak in the former age, Lord Fowl did not dare attack the wraiths. So, like, what's going on, you know, like, uh, how, why is it, or how is it being misused? And, and the fact that it's, it's, it's being used for these different things, she then deduces it's drool, basically, it seems to me. Yeah, and it's a fair deduction. But from that, she extrapolates that he must have the ill earth stone because the staff of law, as you said, is not a neutral tool. It's a tool that's a servant of the earth and the earth's law. So it can't, or at least she believes that it can't be used for anything unnatural or wrong. So what can you conceive of that could corrupt the staff even enough to warp one bird? Mm. Well, perhaps madness gives Drool that will. Huh. Yeah, and there you go, at his peak in the former age, Lord Fowl did not dare attack the wraiths. Yeah. So if the, st- the staff can't be used for evil purposes then, is that what she's saying? I don't know, she's acknowledging that Drool used the staff to attract attack the wraiths, so. But then uh, the other lord gives the counter-argument just after that, and he says, well, if he had such power, then why not just destroy us? Because, I mean, that would require less might and power than attacking the wraith or turning the moon red. Yeah. Um, And then someone says... If I judge truly, then the despiser himself is as much as, as Drool's mercy as we are. Yeah, that seems a bit unlikely. So they're really speculating back and forth about Lord Fowl's intentions and whether uh, he's the guy calling the shot, so it's Drool. Um, and uh, what's the cause of all this turbulent? They speculate it might be Drool. Yeah, they're not really getting anywhere, are they? No. And then they they call back to the, the message where it said that Drill Rock Worm has the staff and that is a cause for terror. He will be enthroned at Lord's Keep in two years if the message fails, but then or so on she is like, but the message hasn't failed. We are forewarned. So the cave whites, that we're told that they're weak creatures, weak willed. Easily swayed, easily enslaved, and they have no heaven-challenging lore. So it's just like a a Wayne with a powerful toy. He's kind of having fun wielding this powerful toy that he has. But then if it can't be used for evil purposes, how is he turning the moon red and eating up the wraiths with the Arviles? Hmm. Curious. Yeah. Mm. Well, then Covenant's like, enough of this. Ask me, he says, and he slowly rises to his feet. (laughs) And it says, he felt that he had gained an insight into the logic of his dream. The staff brought him to the land. He would need the staff to escape. True enough. Seems logical. Uh Right, so that's the thing then. So, um, so the staff is his, like his ticket home. But, again, it's the same question, why not stay? Why, why so desperate to escape to that other life where you're an outcast and just like, yeah. Uh, there's a bit of a mention of his fear of drool. Uh, He hesitated, torn between a fear of drool and a dread of what would happen to him if the Lords did not go in search of the staff. But that's really the only time that his fear of drool is really mentioned. So, I mean, it's not such a... It's not the kind of thing that keeps him up at night. It's not a fear of drool for himself, is it? It's for the land. So... Yeah, He cares about the land. Hmm. So why is he so still so concerned about going going back? Yeah, good question. But anyway, at the moment he, it's that's his incentive to speak like um, the staff, and yeah, brought him to the land, so he might well need it to escape. Yeah, and then he goes on to talk about how Lord Fowl mentioned my enemy. 
which in the book is is a, a proper noun with a capital. Who was he talking about? Yeah, that's a question that Thomas Covenant asks, and yeah. So uh, they they talk about the creator, right? And I think last week in the poem that we had or the song. Law which gave birth to time is the land's creator's self-control. Creator with a capital C. The law is the creator's self-control. Is that effectively what it's saying? I'll give you the whole thing. And beauty is not possible without discipline. And the law which gave birth to time is the land's creator's self-control. Yeah, right. So the law, and we have the staff of law. Yeah, and that's the creator's self-control. Yeah. So if he if there wasn't this law, then the creator would not what? Well, there would be chaos. Uh, restrict himself to to order, maybe I don't know. Yeah. And then it says, but keystone rather pivot crux for the anarchy out of which time was made, and with time earth. And with earth, those who people it, wild magic restrained in every particle of life. So we have law, and then out of the anarchy, time is made. And then out of time, the earth is made. And then from the earth, those who people it. So that's kind of the order that we're talking about from the chaos. So the creator has created constraints, within constraints, time and earth and people. But anyway, so uh, the High Lord basically says, yeah, uh, maybe the Creator is is the one that Fowl was talking about. Uh, but we know nothing of such a being. But they do, though, because they sang that song. <laughs> and then they say, we only know that we are mortal, but Lord Fowl is not. Ah, so I, this is the first time I got any idea that, uh, what, he can't die? In some way, he surpasses flesh. Mm. So when he was defeated at the desecration, he was reduced of power, but he wasn't killed. He just had to bide his time and build up his strength mm. to come back and have another go. But at the time of the desecration, if his intent is dominion of the land, is it? I mean, we don't know that. So then he wouldn't have had access to white gold. Now he potentially has access to white gold. So the dominion that he sought was not achievable, perhaps, at the first desecration. And the lords were lower wise as well at that time. Now they're not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another puzzler. Uh, so if Thomas Covenant is asking the lords, who was he talking, who was Fowl talking about when he said, my enemy? Yes. So the lords say, perhaps the creator. So why would the creator be Thomas Covenant's enemy? No, Fowl's, as described? Lord Fowl's enemy. Ah, I see. That right. was when he was right. in Kevin's okay, watch. Okay. okay, okay, then that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Not Covenant's enemy. All no. right. Right, right. In fact, as we read it, Thomas Covenant might be Fowl's ally. We don't know. He's being manipulated, certainly. However, he he gets one of those flashes, right? So at the moment that the creator is mentioned, he has a flash of the old beggar. Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting kind of wee thing because, like, like what? Did, is that the creator inserting himself into the story here and there? Yeah, or what? I think mm. so. Uh, he gave him the, the message, didn't he, with the conundrum back in, like, the first chapter, wasn't it? Yeah. So you can go back and listen to the episode, folks, because I can't remember what the conundrum was, but it's there. I was kind of... Uh, a mystical thing that kind of went beyond. So it's certainly the first thing I think that I encountered reading which went beyond this kind of awful life that was being described. And I thought might carry on for like 
what, ten books? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was it was a moral question was in the message. It was like a riddle with a a moral puzzler that Covenant had to tease that was teased with. So if the creator was in fact the beggar then the beggar is or the creator's interfering. Mm. Uh well yeah, so maybe that's the whole thing about maybe he's not exercising that self control because the law was the law or the law was his <laughs> self control and that yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we can like chuck it around. Yeah. So yeah, we're back to a paradox here because he's saying that if the creator chose me then inspired by the contradiction then this creator also wanted you to hear Fowl's message take that into account and then Osondria pounces. <laughs> there's the there's the lie, I saw it, the final bait. By raising the hope of unknown help, Lord Fowl seeks to ensure that we will accept this mad quest. She's a bit dramatic, huh? Yeah, a little bit. So he's been manipulated into delivering this message. And I mean, Covenant said this himself. Don't you see this is what he wants you to do? Remember he said that to them. But what else can they do? If they don't go and retrieve the staff, then Lord Fowl's prophecy will come true, I suppose. One, like Drool will be king or whatever in two years. Yeah. And they would only have seven instead of 49 years. Aye. Yeah. I don't quite get the the bigger chess play out, but... No, and it's uh, it's complex. Yeah, right. So they're speculating and all this stuff is going back and forth, like... And then the High Lord, Prothol, basically... Says he's made a decision. Yeah. This is what we're going to do, right? This is what we're going to do. Osandria, you defend the land. Revelstone, yeah. Uh, you defend Revelstone, yeah. And uh, I'm going to go off with Thomas Covenant to <laughs> look for drool in the staff. Aye. <laughs> Basically. So, yeah, he seems decisive. He says something like, my decision is clear. I quite like that. It's good leadership. And he says something like, don't, you know, if I fail, then it's on me, but don't be afraid to follow me. Mm. I I like that. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, okay, makes up a fraction for his complete irresponsibility offering the heat puntership to uh, TC. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. That, that was a crazy yeah. move. Yeah, let's see, let's see how he does. I mean, he's a he's a bit of a feeble old man too. I mean, he he needed to uh, rest on his staff when standing up. You know, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. So, they. Um, oh yeah, there's also this this guy, uh, the the war guy, the war mark Garth. So he's present, yeah. and he had uh, previously said that. We set the uh, sent out the warnings through the land, and and my my soldiers are going to go, and uh, it's going to take six days to get the message out. But we've also got to clear the forest that you guys have to go through, because yeah. they are dangerous. And and so this is where the uh, Lord Prothol says, "Ah, but we're going to go a different route." It's going to take longer, but we're going to go a different route. Or it was expected that they would go north, right? The way that Foam Follower came there in the first place, through Andalane, or round, skirting round Andalane. But they decided, no, they're going to go south and go through Grimmadhor, the forest. <laughs> which uh, says it'll take, it'll take longer. It's more leagues, but safer and unexpected. And then there's this bit here, I love this bit. We get Foam Follower having a chat with TC. Oh, yeah. And he says, you've got a a secret. 
and T T C is worried about it, and Foam follows like, no, it's fine. The heart cherishes secrets not worth the telling. He talks about the fairy Elohim. Right, yeah. He's an ancient race. And Foam Follower is like, don't worry about it. I don't want to know your secret. You keep it. So, yeah, that's right. So Foam Follower approaches Thomas Covenant and says, listen, you know, there's something I want to ask you. And Thomas Covenant says, basically, F off. I know what you're going to ask me. Uh, And, you know... (laughs) Uh, basically, he thinks his uh, foam follower wants to know why Ati Aran was pissed off with him. And that's the yeah. secret that foam follower says is uh, whatever. That's yours, fairies, yeah. blah, blah. <laughs> yours, fairies, blah, blah, yeah. <laughs> but he does want to ask... Let your heart cherish that yeah. secret. But he does want to ask him a question. Yeah, about his dream. That, the dream that he had... In the boat that night. Yeah. And we get a call back to that quotation, there is only one good answer to death. And that's, was it the unctuous voice that said that (laughs) in the dream? Yeah, right. (laughs) And the only answer to death is to turn your back on it, outcast it. And then foam followers' good-natured humour echoed in his ears. Yeah, so presumably that yeah, made him chuckle, huh? Yeah. But I just I love the way that Foam Follower doesn't ask the question Covenant's expecting of him and says, look, it's fine, it's your secret, don't care. And then he keeps his, his humour, sense of humour's the best thing. So then we get a discussion with the blood guard again, and we it's revealed to us that the blood guard do not sleep. All these, uh, what, 2,000 odd years after taking the yeah. vow, the blood guard do not sleep. And Covenant says, then you are already in hell. I thought, yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah. I love a good sleep, me. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and judging by how run down my body felt after just like one night poor sleep. I don't know. I mean, imagine mm. 2,000 years of no sleep, huh? Right. Now we get a discussion about Kevin who killed himself. So it's basically TC. He just doesn't understand the blood guard. I mean, why would you? These are a, a race who took a vow not to sleep for 2,000 years. And, yeah, a vow of loyalty that TC doesn't really understand. Right, so basically, uh, he'd, he went to sleep the previous night, and then in the morning, the blood guard woke him up, and then they had this chat. Uh, and then we get a description of the sun cresting the eastern horizon. So, it's the same, at least it functions in the same way as as our sun. Yeah. And, uh, Banner also shows him his new flag. So TC's got a new flag, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. The white flag, yeah, normally that would be the flag of surrender, wouldn't it? <laughs> In a battle situation. Oh, well, yeah. But no, the, the white flag is the flag for the white gold. For you, our Lord, the sign of white gold. Yeah, you can put it on his profile pic. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then this this bit with the horses, This right? is interesting, yeah. The, the Rana, and this is something that keeps me awake at night, has done for years. The idea that you can call a horse, you do the, the blood guard, they do the whistling thing, each of the ten blood guard whistles for their horse, and as soon as they've whistled, you hear the sound of whinnying, and the th- hoof beats like thunder, and the horses appear. But the horses heard the call weeks and weeks ago, and set off to get there in order to arrive as soon as the blood guard have whistled them. So there's some time travel going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I mean... Given that the Ranahan is so closely bonded with the blood god that they choose, because they're the ones yeah. that choose, right? And uh, then, 
Um, it's, yeah, it's certainly interesting. Uh, so presumably they then know of the blood god's intention before the blood gods themselves. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, how how does that work? Because if we've got the the arch of time, which the creator created out of the chaos, he created time and then he created the earth and blah, blah, blah. So presumably time is linear in this land as it is in our world. But that breaks that law. Uh, well, maybe it accesses the space out of which time had been created. Something mm. that is outside of time. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the difference between eternity and infinity. Maybe. Infinity being mm. an infinite length of eternity being outside of. Interesting. It's just a neat phenomenon that I keep coming back to. Time and time again. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, anyway... Something interesting going on. Um, and uh, so these magnificent horses appear then out of the direct line of the sun. Ten of them wild and challenging animals. And we learn that Covenant is afraid of horses. Doesn't like them. Yeah. I thought I can relate to that, Covenant. It says they're too big and powerful and unpredictable or something and I'm, well, I'm, I'm a husband of a wife with four horses and I kind of feel the same I get where he's coming from I love the beasts but you know they're big especially the new ones that we have we have two heavy horses magnificent beasts but unpredictable, powerful yeah and he has a bit of uh, a chat with the guy who's trained his horse uh, who who claims that he's as good as any Ranahan. <laughs> oh yeah, and Covenant's like, I, I wouldn't want a Ranahan anyway. <laughs> and he seems quite chuffed by that. And then uh, Thomas Covenant mounts the horse and he finds that uh, the uh, the Klingor uh, like, I don't know, which, which is that thing that uh, we've seen before, kind of Sticks. Yeah, it's like a sticky cloth or something. That's what you use to stick the ring to his no, chest. That's what, it, that's what it was. That's what it was, right. The foam follower yeah. gave him a piece on yeah. the boat. Yeah. So that kind of basically uh, is the saddle, huh? Yeah, and they use it also to stick on the, the supplies to the horses so they don't have to tie saddlebags on with straps or anything, they just stick them on with the clinger. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, handy substance, right, you know. I mean, and presumably but okay, let's not speculate too much. It's, it gets Aye. a bit silly. All right, yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, right, so then this is, then we get the sense of the population of the town. Yeah. Yeah, they all they all come out to see the the quest off, and Tamarantha and Variel come out as well, already mounted on horseback, not on Ranahan, just on regular horses, and they say, "We're coming with you." They weren't part of the original quest, but they they reckon that. This is their last chance for a big adventure, so they're going to come. That's right, because Prothol says, All right, hey, okay, so you guys chill out looking after Ravelstone while we go. Said, No, no, we're coming with you. Aye. Uh, and then this line here, which I loved, this is from Morum. He says, Life is well designed. Men and women grow old so that someone will be wise enough to teach the young. Let them come. So bear in mind that these are his parents, Tamarantha and Variol. I see. So, yeah. And uh, they're coming to share their wisdom with these young lords. I just thought that was a lovely little 
phrase. These young lords who are so frail they can barely stand up. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And, well, TC, I guess. Uh, did we speculate about his age? Yeah, mid-thirties or so, huh? I think we did, yeah. That's where I would put him, yeah. Given his kid and things like that. Yeah. Maybe even younger, actually. I don't think we're told at any point, but... Yeah, that would be my guess, anyway. So that's it, they're off. Thus the quest for the staff of law left, Lord's Keep, in the news, in the sunlight of a new day. Oh, and we get the, we've got to remember the Oath of Peace. We're reminded of that. We get this nice little poem. Do not hurt where holding is enough. Do not wound where hurting is enough. Do not maim where wounding is enough. And kill not where maiming is enough. The greatest warrior is one who does not need to kill. Hail Revelstone. So we've had two chapters at Revelstone. Lots of chatting back and forth. Lots of speculation about Fowl's intent. Drool. And now we're off. It's going to change from next week. And the name of the next chapter is Bloodborne. Can't remember what that's about. Hmm. Yeah, born as in the born identity, etc., etc. The same, yeah. the same spelling. Yeah, Jason Bourne. <laughs> and they're off on their quest. So who's left at Revelstone? Just Asondria and some bloodguard, I suppose. Well, there was uh, the the war guy. He said something about over a thousand. Warriors, and uh, yeah, a subsection of that is going to go with with the party. Yeah, and they're going to the the quest are going to go via the plains of Ra, which is the Ranahans' homeland, I suppose. So they'll be able to to get help from the the Raman as well, the horse lords or horse looker afterers. So, there we go. Yeah, another week in Fantasyland goes by. Aye. And where are we? Yes. So, see you next week, folks. Yeah, thanks Thanks for lending us your ears. I hope you're enjoying the book. Let us know. We're over on YouTube, Cam's Campbell Reads, posting it out there as a podcast, and also at theunbelievers.co. So you can head on over there and get the show notes, links and all that. And let us know how you're liking it. Alrighty. Bye, folks. Bye, folks. See you next week.